In this video, I'm going to give you a complete system for reaching your piano goals. Whether you're just starting out, or you've been playing for a while, or you played and took a really long break and you're coming back to it, you're going to find lots of actionable tools that you can use to achieve your piano goals. And at the end of the video, I'll let you know the three major pitfalls that I've seen adult pianists get into that basically stall their progress. And it really doesn't have to be that way. Before we get started, go ahead and download your one year piano blueprint. It's free right below this video. And you can also try out my All Access Pass membership uh, for seven days for free. Check out some of the most popular courses. And I've got a map down there also <laughs> below this video that will help you navigate all the courses that I have. And I'll be talking about why I have so many courses in this video as well. So let's get started. I believe that anyone can play the piano. If you have the desire to play, that means you have the potential to play. Now, how you approach learning to play the piano is really important. There are two things that you need to be able to play the music you want to play. Let's face it, why do you want to play the piano? Because you like the, this certain type of music or certain songs, and you want to be able to make those sounds yourself at the piano. So in order to reach that goal, there are certain things that you need. Number one, and almost no adult pianist pays attention to this because why would you if you don't know, right? The number one thing is you have to have proper piano technique. That means your form at the piano has to use your body in such a way that you don't hurt yourself and that you're able to play fast and you know play chords and coordinate your hands, whatever you want to do. It all starts with technique. Think about any sport that you play or that you watch, there's proper form in that sport. You can't just get out and play it however you want because without following the proper form, you're not able to go to the, um, the potential that you're able, that you should be able to reach. Does that make sense? Just drop a comment. If, if, even if you have a different take on something, I would love to see it. I don't need for you to agree with everything I say, um, so let me know. I will just let you know <laughs> that I've been playing piano my whole life and I've been teaching basically every age you can think of, every goal you can think of, people with uh, physical disabilities, people with mental uh, you know, challenges, different ways of learning, however you want to say it like across the spectrum. I've taught professional musicians. I've taught enthusiastic hobbyists. I've taught people who want to learn one song and they're done. I even taught people who started with me as children and are now professional musicians. So when, when I tell you the stuff I'm telling you in this video, it's from my experience and not something that I read. Um, it's stuff that I've lived. Once you set your technical skills, are you done? No, technique is something that evolves over time, right? We'll talk about that a little more as we get into this video. So you need technique. The other thing you need to be able to play the piano is some way of organizing that musical information in your mind. Even if it's just something as simple as remembering, hey, this song is E, D, C, D, E, E, E. Or let's say you don't even know the note names. You say, okay, I'm going to find this white note. I'm going to go down two white notes. You're still organizing musical information in your, in your mind. So the better you can organize musical information in your mind, the more complex and interesting things you can do with that information. So skills in the form of technique and a way to organize thinking about music. I call that musical language. One of the misconceptions that I, I want to debunk right from the start is uh, people having metrics that are not helpful. That sounds really fancy. Here's what I mean. Things like, I've taken lessons for three years. So the metric is they've been studying with somebody for three years. I've played for release. Uh, I passed this exam. I, I practice five hours a day. None of that tells me about the quality of what you've been doing, just the quantity. 
right? So let's say that you've practiced with a teacher or you've studied with a teacher for a few years and you come to me and you say, I've studied with a teacher for a few years. I want to get better. Um, I want to study with you. And I say, fantastic. I'm so glad that you already have a foundation <laughs> that we can build on. Many times that foundation isn't there. Unfortunately, there is no governing body for piano teachers. Anybody can say that they are a piano teacher. I had a student once who is now a professional musician who started learning piano with a cellist, a cellist who didn't know how to play the piano. And when he came to me, he had been playing, I think, yeah, for two or three years, and we had to start from scratch because while the cellist may know about music, her skills don't translate to playing the piano. It's a, it's a completely different instrument. Theory would be the same, but the application of that theory is very different at the piano. So there's, there's no, like, don't have to pass a, an exam. There's literally nothing. I can say I'm a piano teacher and never having played the piano in my life. As well, online courses, ooh, that's the Wild West. There is no way to know the quality of the online course that you've done unless I've seen what you have completed. So you tell me I've done, you know, I'm not going to name any names. I've done these, these online courses. What's next? I don't know what they teach, so I can't help you. <laughs> I only know you what, what I teach. So if you started with me from scratch, then I know what you've been doing. But I still don't know. For example, if you played for Elise, did you, did you keep a steady beat when you play it? Is your technique good or are your hands, you know, like claws when you're playing? I don't know that from you telling me I've played for Elise. Were you able to use the pedal? Did you add musical um, expression? I don't know any of that from you telling me that you played for Elise. If you tell me I practice five hours a day, I don't know what that means. What do you do when you're practicing? What do you work on? Are you playing things over and over, hoping to get better? I don't know. So these metrics that you think are important really are not helpful. And the reason I say that is because I don't want you to get frustrated and get down on yourself if you say, well, you know, I've been, I've been at this piano for five years and I still can't really get through a song. It's not necessarily and probably isn't. I'll change that. It's for sure not because you don't have talent. It's your approach. It's, it's your system of doing what you're doing, right? So put all those metrics aside, number of years, uh, what courses you've finished, what uh, books you've done, what exams you've passed, you know, that sort of thing. Unless I know the teacher you studied with personally and I know their teaching style, I don't know what your teacher taught you. Uh, and it's more often than not that people come to me from other teachers that are missing very basic skills and knowledge. Regina says, I just finished your Obama's scales number one and loving the, the uh, become a piano superhero too. So thankful for your courses. I'm so glad, Regina. And Regina, you did start with my courses. I don't know if you played before, but you started from the ground up on my courses and you took some lessons with me. So I have seen you play and I know that you're definitely on the right track i can tell does does this make sense what i've said so far or did you hear something that you know maybe it was the first time you've heard something like this let me know i want to debunk another myth or not a myth um a pitfall which is that people write to me and say hey i've already started two or three other courses i'm not really seeing results like one person said to me they signed up for a very famous membership and again not naming names and basically all they had was like youtube style videos and it didn't make sense yeah it was not expensive membership i think it was like 20 something dollars a month but there was nothing in there that was like a systematic approach to learning the way you would get with a good teacher right so the, the pitfall I see is someone coming to me and saying, I've already signed up for these courses. Let me at least finish them before I start with yours. This is the sunk cost fallacy, meaning I've already given my time and money to this thing that's not working. 
and I don't want that to go to waste. So let me sink some more time. Like that doesn't make any sense. Cut your losses and find something that right away starts to click for you. And that doesn't mean that you're going to right away become a maestro. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that right away it starts to click. Like you're already noticing yourself being able to do things that maybe you couldn't do before that are happening more easily. that are making sense. Like for example, you might start with one of my technique courses and I, I uh, recommend that everybody starts with become a piano superhero one. I'll more about that later. But if you start with that and immediately you're noticing that, wait a minute, I'm using my body very differently than what I did before. That's what I mean by it's clicking, right? There's not going to be any sort of course that you start and like one week later, you know, your fingers are flying over the keys if that's not where you started. Okay. So if you've already invested in other programs, other teachers, and you're thinking, well, you know, I've given the money, let me finish it. Of course, that's your choice. But, you know, look up cost sunk fallacy and you'll understand why that's just really not um, the logical way to go. Makes sense. Thank you, Jan. Jan, you're also one of the people that's been with me for years. And I don't know if I was your first like teacher, your first online teacher, but I know that you've been following everything in the order that I recommend, and you are definitely seeing the results as well. Really, really proud of you. So I talked about the technique courses. Now, I had someone recently ask me, why in the world do you have so many courses and why do they overlap, especially those technique courses? So I think this person was asking from a perspective of just not understanding what it takes to play the piano, which is fair because if they knew the background of what it takes to play the piano, then they would have already been playing. So here's the thing with piano technique. You don't learn it once and say, I, okay, I, can, I have good piano technique. It's a process of, yes, overlapping skills done from different perspectives. The way I teach piano technique is very different from anyone else that I've seen. I focus on something that's called neuromuscular re-education. Fancy word. All right. What in the world is neuromuscular re-education? What I do is I take you through micro movements, tiny repetitive movements on different parts of the piano done correctly. And the way I know you're going to do them correctly is I literally practice with you on the videos. I have never in my courses said, here is what you're supposed to do. Now go do it without first having gone through the actual physical process with you on video, talking you through it, coaching you through it the way I would if you were sitting next to me as my private student. This is how I make sure that you're not just repeating exercises for the sake of doing exercises, but while you're doing these starting off very simple exercises, you are re-educating your muscles and your nerves on how to move properly at the piano one tiny movement at a time. Recently, someone asked me, um, she hasn't taken my courses, which is fine, but she's seen a lot of my YouTube videos. Now, in YouTube videos, I can't give you an entire course of study. That's not how YouTube is set up, right? You randomly search for videos depending on what you think you need. But then again, you're not the expert at piano, so maybe you don't know exactly what you need. So you're not even looking for the video that would be the thing that would help you. So I can't do this on YouTube. That's why I made courses. And she had seen the YouTube videos that say you need to uh, use your wrist and fall into every note. And that is 100% true. I stand behind that statement. But of course, when you're playing a piece of music, you can't fall into every note. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll link some videos below of technique. Those are starting points. You can't fall into every note. And that's why after, in my courses, after we do the falling into every note 
kind of practice, then I show you how to do groups of two notes or three notes or fast runs because that technique is, even though it's similar in the sense that you have to be relaxed, you know, you have to use gravity, your fingers have to be round if possible, but the technique for playing a fast run, very, very different from the technique of playing repeated chords or, you know, a slow lyrical piece. It's, think of literally any sport. Let's take golf, okay? If I say to you, hey, I want to learn how to play golf, and you say, oh my gosh, it's so easy. You grab the club, you hold it, you put down the ball on that, on the tee. See, I'm not a golfer. You, you look at where you want your ball to go. You swing the club, and you hit the ball, and there you go. You know how to play golf. <laughs> Do you really? know how to play golf? No. It really depends on the, the kind of turf you're on. If you're in a sand pit, right? Everything's going to, everything that you do in golf is going to require a different approach. This is why even the best golfers, they're still practicing. They don't say, I know how to play golf. Why should I practice? Right? So if you are a beginner pianist and I tell you in the beginning, you have to fall into every note by using your wrist, that's like me teaching you how to hold the golf club and just kind of how to rotate your torso. That's not the whole thing. That's part of it, and it's where you start. If you don't know how to hold the golf club, you got nothing, right? So, And if you don't know how to transfer the weight of your body into the keyboard by way of your fingers, you don't know how to play the piano. You may be able to play some notes, but that's not the same as playing the piano. As you develop your skills of technique, of being able to get around that keyboard, what you do is you're able to play more complex pieces. And even the simplest song to be played on the piano already has a, a you know, like a group of complex skills that go into it, much less the stuff that everybody wants to play. You know, you got into playing the piano because you heard a song you like, or there's a piece, classical piece that you want to play. There's a lot of complex skills being put together to play that piece. And another thing people ask me on emails is, how can I get better at piano? How can I answer you that in an email, right? I can say, look, take these courses. They will lead you through increasingly complex movements that then you can apply to playing the music you want to play. If you're hearing stuff that is feeling discouraging for you, I really encourage you not to be discouraged because this is actually a time to celebrate. I'm giving you the the real, the truth behind playing the piano. It doesn't mean you're going to study for years and years and then play a piece of music. No. What I'm saying is, if it's not happening for you right away, there's a reason. It's the system that you're using. And that's good because you can change your system, right? It's not a fault in you. Now, should you be playing pieces or songs while you're working on your technique? Yes, why not? But <laughs> the, the music that you play should be at a, at a lower level, at least on the same level, as the technique that you're working on. The reason for this is as you're doing the neuromuscular re-education in my courses for about 10 minutes a day, then you move on to a piece that's really challenging you technically, what you're going to do is kind of erase the gains that you made in your technique course because now you're really concerned about playing the right notes and your technique has gone out the window. So what you're doing if you are working on your technique and you're not an advanced pianist, if you're working on your technique and playing pieces or songs that are far above the level you should be playing, you're making the process much, much longer than it needs to be promise you. Don't approach piano like you're here to learn songs. Approach piano like you're here to learn how to be a pianist. Then you can have the freedom to play the songs you want to play. You've got it backwards, a lot of you. Not if you're studying with me, but if you're just watching this. You're learning songs hoping that that's going to help you learn piano. No, 
learn to be a pianist. Learn how to organize musical thought. If that means learning to read music, great. If not, you know, if you want to play by ear, you have to learn how to play by ear. You should know about theory, right? And learn how to use your, uh, your body at the piano. That's how you become a pianist who can play music. Jay says, I played electric bass in a blues band for five years. I got the theory part down okay, but piano is a different animal. Absolutely right, Jay. Absolutely right. The theory doesn't change. So like if you know about scales and chords, you can apply that to the piano. But the physical aspect of it and, you know, when you're playing the when you're playing bass, you basically are playing one note at a time, maybe two notes at a time, right? One hand is, you know, strumming or plucking or slapping or however you do it, and the other is pressing down the strings. When you're playing the piano, you're not holding your instrument, you're in front of it, so already the approach is different, and both hands are doing independent things, meaning one can play chords while the other one plays melodies, or they can both play chords, or they can both play melodies. So there's a very different set of skills that need to be learned to play the piano. And it's really good that you already have this background in music, you know, you've probably developed your ear to an extent, you understand a lot. So for you, it's going to go faster than for someone who doesn't have any idea about music. You already know how to organize musical thought. You may need to learn, if you want to learn to read music, you, want, you may need to learn how to read two, um, you know, the grand staff, two staves at the same time, where you've got the right-hand part and the left-hand part. Bass, if you're, if you're playing from music, and probably you weren't, probably you're playing by ear, you know, or a chart or something, then you're only concerned with like one line of music. So you still need to work a little bit on the processing of the language of music. Does that make sense? It is a different animal. <laughs> it's a really nice animal if you know how to tame it. One of my goals this year is to work on hand independence. Jay, I think you've started Become a Piano Superhero 1, uh, and that's good. That's really good. That's going to help you with that. My superhero course is really helping. Thank you so much. I love knowing that. I love knowing that. Um, so just as an aside, I, I created every single exercise in my courses. I didn't take the exercises that I had grown up with. What I did was I filtered everything I had studied, everything I had learned, including my bout with tendonitis that ended my piano career, potentially. And I had to relearn how to play the piano, technically. Um, so I put all that basically into a big bowl. And I said to myself, self, if someone's learning to play the piano and they want to be able, you know, just to do it for fun, what skills do they need to have in order to have a hobby, a piano hobby that pays off, that gives them gratification? So I said, these are the skills that they need to have. All right. How can I build those skills? And I went, you know, layer by layer, I literally created something that doesn't exist anywhere else on the internet. Okay. Um, so I'm glad that it's helping. For me, that's very gratifying knowing that I put everything I have into these courses. They are not, I'm not a course creator who set out to make money. I'm a piano educator who, in order to reach people that I'll never meet, had to make courses and put them on the internet. Very different in the sense of what my goal was. My goal wasn't to retire rich, you know, at a certain age. My goal was to empower people around the world to be able to make music. That's my way of making the world a better place. And yes, I have to charge for my work because I also have bills to pay. I, you know, spent a lot of money getting my education. The tools I use, you know, the software and the hardware costs a lot of money. So yeah, I can't give it away for free. But my motivation isn't to, you know, take your money. <laughs> so Jan says, also the scale runs in Become a Piano Superhero 1 are great warm-ups. Yeah. You know what else are great warm-ups, Jan? Those courses that have like the pieces that I wrote. You know, not the exercises, but just like the, the music, the songs that you can play at the end of certain sections. Those are also really great warm-ups. 
<laughs> if you haven't read my book, um, Practice Makes Permanent, you definitely want to start doing that. And that brings my next point. What do you do when you're practicing? Do you jump around from one thing to another? You know, do you repeat endlessly, hoping to get it right? These aren't the best uses of your time. There are specific ways that I practice for myself and for my students. Literally things that I do every time. Still, when I'm learning a piece of music, <laughs> sorry, when I'm learning a piece of music that's challenging for me or I have like very little time to learn something, I use certain steps to learn. It's not talent, okay? Um, so I put all those steps in my book, Practice Makes Permanent. And there's an ebook and an audiobook version. You can, you know, listen to it in your car. It's me talking to you. And there's a bunch of downloads that you can print out so you don't have to remember anything. Your three-minute warm-ups take me longer than three minutes. Are they designed for the intermediate beginner? Jay, uh, the three-minute warm-up, I just kind of chose that number. It takes you however long it takes you. Every three-minute warm-up lesson has a portion of a live video that I did when I first started the membership. I hope that you've watched it. And if you haven't, it's okay. It's on every single one. You can watch it. Um, you, the three-minute warm-ups, I create those, and they're gone every single day. And the reason they're gone every single day is because I want, I want you to keep coming back to playing the piano every day, even if it's just for a few minutes. And the reason that there's no sheet music is because I want you to start seeing patterns in music that you play. And so I keep these warm-ups pretty short, and I write on the screen what patterns you can be looking for. Sometimes there are more patterns than what I'm writing about. But, you know, I point out the most important ones. And if it takes you 10 minutes, that's okay. That's where you are right now. For me, if I were to watch those, it would take me like 30 seconds, you know, because my skill level is, is very high. This is what I do. This is what I've done my whole life, right? But, I, but in order to get from, you know, not being able to see patterns to being able to see pattern right away and replicate it, you have to go through the learning journey. However long it takes you, it takes you. If you're not perfect at it, who cares? It's the process that's important. I want to talk about the pitfalls that I see all the time with people. And the reason I want to talk about these is not to discourage you. It's to empower you. So if you know going in, like, you know, if you're going to take a road trip and you know that you're going to be driving through snow, you don't ignore it. You know, oh, I don't, I don't want to know about the snow. No, you want to pack snow tires or, you know, chains, whatever. You want to know what the road ahead is going to be like, right? Even if there are things that aren't things that you want to know. So this is why I'm going to tell you this next part so that you can prepare yourself and maybe even recognize yourself and say, maybe that's why things aren't happening for me. All right. I know you can play piano if if you want to, I know you can do it, and I know if you have the right system, it's totally possible for you. I want to make sure that you all understand that before I move on. Number one, above all else, consistency is key. You must make playing the piano a part of your life. You can't wait until you have time or energy or feel like it not a good game on the, you know, whatever. You can't wait until the conditions are right because the conditions are almost never perfect. You have to put it in. You don't say to yourself, huh, you know, I wonder, should I go to work today? Nah. Unless you're independently wealthy and or you're the boss and, you know, but even if you are, you can't do that every day and wait until, you know, you're available <laughs> to go to work. It's just part of your life. Now, piano is not your job, but if you want to get good at it, you have to be consistent in your practice, even if it's just 10 minutes a day. If you're doing my courses, do one video lesson from a technique course. And if that's too much, do half of it. Or do one video lesson from Piano Bootcamp, whatever you're working on. If you have more time, practice a part of your piece that you're working on following good practice techniques that you would learn in my book, Practice Makes Permanent. So 
it's not so much that, you know, you knock it out of the park every time you sit at the piano. That's important. What's important is to be there. Think of playing the piano like a friendship, right? So you know that if you don't talk to friends for a long time, if you've been lifelong friends, it's a little bit different. But if it's like a newer friend, you don't talk for a while. Eventually you stop talking because like it just feels weird to connect. But if, you know, you're talking to someone on a, on a daily basis or weekly basis, you know, it's, it's more comfortable. So think of the piano as your friend and you want to touch base daily if possible. Every other day is okay, but you have to be consistent. When you are consistent every day, what you're doing is you're ramping up your skills progressively. And before you know it, you look back and you say, man, I've actually achieved a lot. Like Anna, you know, told me we haven't, she hasn't practiced in a little bit because there were things happening, but she kind of took stock of everything that she has accomplished and said, wow, you know, I'm glad I looked back because I would have been down on myself if I hadn't. So this, this daily, you know, ramping up when you barely see any progress, it really adds up. It's very similar to, you know, getting fit or losing fat. You know, you don't see it immediately in one day. But n next thing you know, like your clothes are fitting differently if you're consistent with it. Jay says, do you recommend spending time on technique courses and learning a song or just focus on technique? Yeah. So, Jay, again, um, if you are working on a song that is at or slightly below your technical level right now, that's good. It can't just be any random song for the reasons that I stated. Because if it's a piece that is way too advanced for you, you're going to fall back into very bad technical um, uh, habits just because you're trying to you know, get the notes. Does that make sense? 30 minutes a day is amazing, Jay. Um, if you're spending 30 minutes, spend, you know, 15, 20 of it on technique and then get a very simple, I would recommend maybe the Alfred um, Adult Beginner's Book and start there. Okay. Or I don't know if you've done Piano Boot Camp or Instant Piano. Those are both there for you for free inside the membership. Go through those. Because what they do, they don't just teach you how to read music. They show you how to read piano music <laughs> and how to coordinate your hands. And again, through micro movements, I don't ever throw this big thing at you and say, hey, good luck to you. And if you can't do this, you're too old. <laughs> okay. Ave Maria. Yeah, that's Ave Maria is good. Take it very slow. And Jay, focus on how I am playing. Look at my wrists. Look at my fingers. Don't just try to get the notes. Does that make sense? If you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one for like a half an hour where I can like really address your particular, you know, way of playing, get you on the right track, let me know. We can do that or not. But just make sure you're on a level that you can handle technically. Pitfall number two. You want to play music. You want to play songs. We all do. If you see that, like playing a piece of music well, I see it as a peak experience, right? It's something that makes you feel great. You're in the flow. This is what you signed up for. In order to have that peak experience, you need to have daily work habits that build up to that peak experience. So I would strongly recommend that you fall in love with the journey, with the daily tasks of playing the piano, you know, exploring the sounds, exploring how you move, learning a small piece of Ave Maria, just a small piece and being able to play it. Close your eyes, you know, play it for someone. Make every single time you sit at the piano special. Victor Wooten, I think it was Victor Wooten, the famous bassist. Jay, I don't know if you know of him. He's been playing bass his whole life professionally. I think it was him. I watched him do a talk once. And he said, how would you play your instrument if you knew that it was the last time you were going to play it? What kind of energy would you bring to that? 
Yeah, you know of Victor Victor Wooten. He's he's very uh, I love him because he's not just an amazing musician, but he he's a great thinker, you know. And yeah, and if it's the last time you're going to play your instrument, how would you approach it? Would you look at it like not these scales again? No. You would make sure you really enjoyed playing those scales, right? So make every day special. Every time you sit at the piano, make it special. Fall in love with the journey. Don't wait until you can play a piece, quote, perfectly before you enjoy playing. Fall in love with the process. The third thing is um, it's kind of a hybrid. So unless you are a trained piano educator, you've taken pedagogy courses, you understand the learning journey, you know how to play at a high level, you understand what it takes to do certain things, unless this is you, then you really don't know what it takes to play the piano. Let me give you the, the analogy. I see a house that I think is beautiful, and I want to make a house like that. But I don't have any training in architecture, engineering, plumbing, electricity. I have no clue how to dig a foundation and why I should. So if I made a house just from the parts that I could see, you know, the beautiful windows, you know, the way the walls are, if I copied that house just from what I could see without any of the background knowledge of what it takes to make that house stand, not collapse, and be usable, how viable would my house be? This is what a lot of adults do when they try to learn piano. They watch someone play. Usually it's someone who has been obsessed <laughs> with playing the piano for years. And that's how they got to the level where people watch them and admire them. And they say, okay, just show me where to put my fingers and then I'll practice. That's not how it works. There are foundational things that you don't know. So when you're teaching yourself to play the piano and you come to me and say, what should I do next? What should I do? A lot of times what people want to hear is play this song next. But that's not what I say. <laughs> I say do this course in this order exactly the way I laid it out for you. It wasn't by accident. I did it on purpose. Uh, and sometimes people say, well, let me learn as much as I can on my own and then I'll and then I'll check out your stuff. Again, you don't know what you don't know. So how do you know what you need to learn before you come to my stuff? Again, I'm not saying this to discourage you. I'm saying it to empower you so that the time that you spend, the money that you spend learning the piano actually pays off for you. Okay? So if you are doing my courses, please do them in the order that I list them. Do all of the exercises in the order that I present them. There's a reason I did that. If something feels too easy, fantastic. Play it once and move on. You might find that it looked easy, but there was something that in there that was a bit of a challenge for you. If that's the case, then that's the thing that you need to work on. So the pitfall is unless you know exactly what you need to learn to play like those people that you admire, you can't create your own piano education, even if you get a book. Because the book doesn't show you how to play correctly. It can give you tips, right? Videos uh, are ideal. And that's why my courses have videos so that you can see what I'm doing. Does that make sense? All right. Do you have any questions? This is a very long video. And next time somebody asks me the question that, that I always get, I'm going to send them this video. So uh, I'm also going to put something here to make sure that they watch the video. If you have written to me asking me about your piano journey and I sent you this video and you've watched this whole thing, 
The next time you write to me, I want you to say, Elvis has big ears. Then I'll know that you watched it. Elvis has big ears. <laughs> Elvis is my dog. He has big ears. Do you have any questions? Anna says, yes, it makes sense. And expand the screen to full so that you can really see how Marina plays. Yeah, that's a really great tip, Anna. So when you're watching my videos, whether they're courses or whatever, some kind of tutorial, um, put it on a big, as big a screen as you can, because I promise you, the important part isn't the notes that you're playing. The important part is how you're playing the notes that you're playing. And I, and I show you that, okay? Uh, it's funny because um, when we're learning, there's only so much information we can take in at one time. And I know even the most dedicated, the best students miss, miss some things just knowing from the questions that they ask. So it's a really good idea if it's something that was a little bit challenging to watch it a few times and listen to what I'm saying. So I hope that you got a lot out of this video and that you'll continue on your piano journey. Playing the piano is a very rewarding way to, to spend your time. Now, if you want to learn about the most effective practice techniques that I use for myself and my students, you'll want to watch these videos next. Keep practicing, have fun, and I'll see you soon.